All right, my name is Rachel Woody. I'm here with Lonnie Wright, and we are on June 15th, I believe. Yes. Thank you. So my first question for you, Lonnie, is um, we were talking a little bit about origins a little while ago, and there's the Sandus family, which I believe were the first family in this area? Well, actually, the Mespley family that owned uh, this farm was the first family. The Sandoz family was the next family to come, and they were the first ones to plant grapes in the Mill Creek Valley, in the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe they planted grapes uh, right around uh, early 1880s. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I was given a history by uh, Bud Sandoz and uh, he said that the, when the three brothers, they were French-speaking brothers that came from uh, Switzerland. And uh, when they first came out, the first thing they did was plant grapes because they wanted to have their wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, then they, uh, they did uh, uh, truck gardening and uh, raised vegetables and then took vegetables into Fort Dalles and sold them in there. So that's how they made their living. Um, Let's see, where are we going with that? Uh, well, they had, uh, they had uh, grapes in, I think until around, uh, probably around uh, 1900, and then I think they took them out. And it wasn't long after that. I'm not positive. Uh, each county had their own date that they started prohibition, mm -hmm. but the state of Oregon started in 1918, which was earlier than the nation the nation did and so when they I've been told by Bud Sandoz who's, who's kind of the the, the uh, family historian that uh, when they uh, announced prohibition in Oregon that the family went back out and planted wine grapes again and started a, a winery uh, started their winery back up at their place because now they're gonna make some real money mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, that the building is still there, and it's about a mile up the road from here. And they sold uh, they sold wine for a dollar a gallon through Prohibition. And anybody in the, there, there actually was two places out on Mill Creek that you could come if you lived in the Dalles. Uh, one was what they called Whiskey Gulch, which was about a mile down that road. And there was a guy that made whiskey up that that canyon. And then the other one was the Sandozes uh, for the wine. Um, so that was kind of the Sandoz family and, and the fact that they were growing grapes early on I think had something to do with uh, Louis Comini deciding that he could put grapes in on this property and the Sandoz and the, and the Mespleys had uh, a, long, a long relationship between the two families. Uh, Theodore Mespley owned uh, this property which is now uh, called the Pines, and uh, Theodore uh, was the brother of uh, Toussaint Mespley, who was one of the first uh, uh, priests in the Catholic Church here in, in, in the Dalles. Of course, in those days it was known as Fort Dalles. And, uh, <clears throat> and so to, uh, Theodore was down in the uh, California gold fields trying to pan for gold down there. He'd come over from France, French speaking, and uh, Toussaint was at Fort Vancouver and was ordained, I believe, at Fort Vancouver. Uh, but when, when the fort sent a detachment over to build Fort Dalles to protect settlers on the Oregon Trail after the, um, the Whitman Massacre, uh, Toussaint Mespley was one of the first uh, to, to, to come in over here in the Dalles. And he wrote his brothers in, uh, that were down in uh, California, the 49ers, as it were, uh, but it was about 1850, to forget about trying to pan for gold down there on stuff that had already been worked over and move up to Oregon because they were giving land away up here. So that's how they got up here. Uh, Theodore Mespley and his brother, I think uh, he had another brother, I believe, that uh, settled over in Shampooey, near mm -hmm. Shampooey State Park. And, um, but we have water rights off of Mill Creek from 1851 here. Matter of fact, I, uh, when we were trying to decide what we are going to name our winery, uh, since there are so many pine this and pine that, and this place has always been known as the Pines, um, 
we decided to name it the Pines, but I decided to put a date with it. And so I said, well, let's call it the Pines 1851. And one of my friends says, oh, the Pines 151, huh? And I said, no, nah, let's call it 1852. <laughs> so that's the name of our winery. Um, anyway, I'm getting off the track. So, let's see, where are we going with this now? Uh, we're talking about the Mesplies moving into the area. Right. Okay, so Toussaint Mespli, who was the brother of the guy that owned this farm, and the guy that owned this farm was Theodore. Toussaint Mespli uh, was, when they built Cascade Locks, and in those days it was known as the locks around the Cascades, the, in the Columbia River. The Cascades were a famous uh, uh, rapid in the Columbia River. And... Uh, so when they built Cascade Locks, that was done between 1880 and 1890. And I am pretty sure that Louis Comini was uh, one of about 50 Italian stonemasons that worked on that project. And the information that I've gotten from his family uh, is that uh, Toussaint Mespli was uh, uh, conducting masses. He would ride over, circuit rider, he'd ride over to Cascade Locks and conduct masses. And then he offered uh, Louis Comini a job to be the, uh, the headstone maker for the Catholic cemetery because they had a Protestant headstone maker and they wanted a good Catholic headstone maker. So uh, that's how Louis Comini came to the Dalles. And, and I'm assuming that since uh, he was working for Toussaint Mespli, being uh, his boss and the priest at the Catholic Church, and Toussaint's brother was Theodore Mespli, that that's how the relationship began uh, between Theodore and Louis. And what's really interesting is that uh, uh, Louis Comini planted this vineyard and he didn't own the land. Mm. Um, so I guess the next question is, when was a vineyard planted? I don't know for sure. Um, we have pictures uh, that were in uh, a, a publication that was put out by the Union Pacific Railroad and the Dallas Civic Club. Uh, and a picture was taken in 1911 of a vineyard on Mill Creek Road and uh, with a Model T, or also Model A. I never have figured out what, what kind of car that was but uh, in the foreground. And uh, the, the vines look pretty mature. Uh, so I know that uh, in the early 1900s, uh, well actually the Sandozes had planted in the late 1800s, in the 1880s for sure. And I know that uh, there was this vineyard and I think there was another one up on uh, what's called Cherry Heights and that was the Fleck Vineyard. And I'm not sure when that one was planted, but, but I know that they were uh, in production in the early 1900s. So uh, I've, I've actually uh, uh, met the son of, the, of Frank Fleck, uh, and he talked to me about that uh, years ago. So now we have uh, Louis Comini's plant of the vineyard, um, and uh, there's a few stories about Louis Comini that uh, are pretty outstanding that has been told to me by his family. Um, Louis Comini lived to be 95 years old, I believe. Um, I think he passed away in the 60s. And uh, he, was all, he, he was a stonemason as well as a winemaker. Uh, he just made wine for home consumption. Um, he's built two stone houses in the Dalles that are still standing. Uh, and also the grotto in Portland. Uh, he was one of the people that worked on building the grotto in Portland, which is apparently a well-known landmark. I, I frankly have never seen it. I, I went looking for it one day, but I guess I didn't look hard enough. Um, when I finally found out who had uh, actually planted this, this vineyard, um, I kind of, I, I mentioned her name in a magazine article that came out uh, a, a 
on Oregon agriculture, and they they had to do a, a story on, on on this old Vines Inn vineyard that I was now running, and uh, so I received a phone call from uh, Louis Comini's uh, granddaughter, and she proceeded to tell me an awful lot about him. Mm -hmm. um, it, in addition to the stone houses and helping to build the grotto in Portland, he was also an opera singer. And uh, on his 90th birthday, most of the family came up, but she wasn't able to make it. She was in San Francisco for something, and I don't know what. But uh, he called her on the phone and sang opera to her on his 90th birthday. <laughs> he had... Uh, <clears throat> he outlived uh, two wives. And when Louis Comini was 65 years old, he had twin sons with his, sec with his third wife. I believe he had about, uh, I think there probably was around eight or ten kids between the three wives, uh, first one being born in Cascade Locks. Um, after, after we bought the place, um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Laura Comini, who was married to one of the twin brothers. And uh, Laura is very active in the Dow. She's active in the Chamber of Commerce. I didn't know that... Uh, I actually had been working on this vineyard for years and didn't know who planted it. And it was just a fluke thing and kind of let the cat out of the bag and then the Comini family started talking to me about it. And uh, so Laura was married to one of the twin brothers and uh, and she brought her her husband had died. She was a widow at that point. And this was about 2003, I believe. And she brought the other twin brother over here to the farm. And he told of how his earliest memories were of him and his brother picking grapes up on the vineyard mm -hmm. up here and bringing them down to the Pines Dairy and putting them in a hand crank and doing a hand crank uh, for the destemming process in order to start the wine being made. And then uh, some of the other things that he told me was about uh, him and his brother and uh, the guy that uh, later became a fire chief in the Dows, uh, Frank can't think of Frank's last name. Frank Keene, I think it was. But uh, of them going down in the cellars and stealing, stealing their dad's uh, wine. <laughs> and that's actually how I, how I got that name, was because Frank, when he was about 80 years old, and this was probably 20 years ago, uh, no, it was probably longer than that, 25 years ago, uh, I was talking to him out at the golf course here in the Dallas, and Frank told, was telling me that same story about how they used to go down there and steal the wine. And I said, well, what kind of wine was it? He said, I don't know. I think they call it Dago Red. And, uh, well, there's only one Dago Red, and that's Zinfandel. And this is the only Zinfandel vineyard that I know of in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's when I started putting it together that... Uh, on, on who had planted the vineyard, and, th and then and then when an inkling of it came out, then the family started getting in touch with me, and I found out that yes, that was the case. But nobody seems to know exactly when, and nobody seems to know exactly when where the cuttings came from. That's one of the big questions. Uh, my wife and I just went to Italy uh, last month, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do in Italy was research vineyards from uh, the area that uh, Louis Comini had come from and he came from around Genoa. And uh, when we researched that, I, it became pretty clear to me that the, that the vines could not have come from the old country. I think that uh, the cuttings probably came up from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and actually, you can do some DNA testing, and my uh, partner in, in another vineyard uh, suggested that I uh, get the old vine DNA tested, so maybe we can find the source. Because Louis Comini had been buying grapes from uh, the Bay Area for a number of years. I don't know how many years, but, but that was a pretty standard practice. That's how a lot of Italians ended up in California. Italians were spread all over the country 
would buy grapes and the grapes would show up on train and then they'd take, take them off the trains and uh, make wine. And, and then after, after a while, usually if there was a colony of Italians someplace, they would send somebody to be their representative to Sonoma, Napa, and Lodi, and those areas, and buy the grapes. And then after a while, a lot of them just moved there. That's how the Mondavis got started. They, they, they were actually working uh, iron mines up in uh, Minnesota. And uh, Robert Mondavi's father was sent to uh, the Sonoma area to, uh, to, to, to uh, decide which vineyards the grapes were going to come out of that were being shipped up to Minnesota. And then after about three or four years of that, they just decided to move there. So, um, so I'm kind of lost again. Where did I go with that now? Where are we at? That's all right. We were talking about Lou Camini, um, not quite knowing what date the, the vines were planted, then talking about the vines themselves and the possible origins. Right. Okay, so Bud Sandoz, who uh, viewed himself as a historian, especially for the Sandoz family, uh, he wrote a book, uh, History of the Sandoz Family in the Mill Creek Valley, 1880 to 2004. And he gave me one of the books that I, I actually have, number 11. And, uh, and then Bud uh, also found this book and it was the book of uh, uh, put out by the Union Pacific Railroad and the Dow Civic Club. I touched on this earlier, but it had a picture of this vineyard in it, and uh, um, Bud seemed to think that that was this one. Um, so we have, I've got a couple of pictures. Uh, the, the picture that came out of that book, he copied every page of that book for me, about 30 some pages front and back. Gave that to me as a Christmas gift. And then he gave me the book that he had authored that he finally got put together. And then Bud died about, uh, he probably two months after he gave me this, this book. And uh, so uh, the connection was that uh, Toussaint Mespli was the priest at the Catholic Church. That was Louis Comini's boss. Mm -hmm. And uh, Toussaint's brother, Theodore, was the guy that owned this farm. And then uh, in the early 20s, uh, when Theodore passed away, the Pines Dairy was built. And, uh, and actually, uh, it's, it's, on the, uh, uh, it's on the title. Uh, the property title that uh, the company that that owned this property was the Pines Corporation and uh, so that's where we took our name for our winery from uh, and uh, I can't think of uh, a lot of other information I can tell you about uh, Louis uh, um, there's some more history out there, but I just haven't got it all on earth yet. Yeah. So the the uh, the vineyard is. Uh, I think that the vineyard was planted between 1890 and 1900, and because I think in order to show that mature of vines, it, as in that picture, in 1911, that they probably had to be around for at least 10 years, and the timing would have fit in there as well because. I know that Louis Comin the Cascade Locks project was finished in 1890, and I think he moved over to the Dalles at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't tell you for sure. Uh, and then I think uh, the, uh, the, pr the property went through some different hands. There were some people that, uh, that actually farmed it for a while, and uh, the the grapes were uh, sold to home winemakers in uh, North Portland uh, and a lot of Italian home winemakers. And in those days, it was a five hour drive one way to get here to pick up those grapes. And then they had to drive five hours back as well because there was no freeway. And, uh, and that was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the farm was bought by 
a fellow from uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, he was a Mormon fella, uh, doesn't drink, had no use for uh, wine. Uh, basically, uh, he had invested in this farm with another fellow that wanted to make it a health, like a health farm. Uh, fat farm. Yeah, fat farm. And uh, uh, ultimately, the other fellow uh, ended up selling his share out to uh, uh, Keith, uh, or Ken Melby. Ken Melby was the guy's name in Salt Lake. And Ken owned it from 1964 until I bought it from him. I bought it in 2002. In 1982, um, I moved here. And uh, actually, I didn't move on this property. I, I moved into the gorge. And, uh, and that's when I started working on that on that vineyard. And that vineyard had been abandoned for almost 20 years. Um, and it was almost dead. And and then we started uh, doing some work on it and brought it back. Uh, so we've got we've got plants that are at least 100 years old and uh, we're we're still taking grapes off of them and making some pretty good wine. You got a chance to try that wine? Yeah, was it, it was okay? amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> um, when I was working on the vineyard, well, that's a, that's kind of another story. That's another chapter, and that's kind of the chapter about me now, I guess, uh, and, sure. and where I started. So, do you want me to go that direction now? Yeah, uh, we can. We can pause, pause and take a, a break. Um, okay. As long as you feel that you've said what you needed to say about the, the Sandos family and the Wikimini and the mess, please. I think you definitely covered what I had in my notes. Okay. Um, so any last thoughts on them before we start part two? Well, I mean, those were true pioneers. That's, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, grapes have been around in this area for a long, long time. Uh, and it's uh, it's fun to see it come back again. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, and we'll take a break. All right. I'm Rachel Woody. I'm here with Lonnie Wright, and we're doing a part two, talking in the more modern era and uh, the wine industry here today. And so, Lonnie, my first question for you for this portion is, why wine? Why wine? Uh, I got an opportunity that, uh, uh, to go to work for uh, Chateau St. Michel uh, in 1978. And at that time, that, even I realized that that was pretty cutting edge for the Northwest. There were about five or six wineries in uh, Washington and about 10 or 12 in, in Oregon. And, uh, and so I was working at an irrigated farm and Chateau St. Michel uh, bought the farm. and announced that they were going to plant 2,000 acres of grapes in the next three years. And so that's what we did. Uh, and I ended up uh, managing about 650 acres and actually ran the first harvest. The vineyard's now known as Columbia Crest Vineyard, but uh, St. Michel uh, and Columbia Crest are both held by the same company. So that's how I got into wine. Uh, I'd always liked wine. But I didn't know much about it, and I didn't know anything about growing grapes until that time. Um, so, about my, about the end of my second, you know, about halfway through my second year down uh, there, and I had lived in, uh, that was in the Patterson area, and I'd lived down there for about eight years at that point. Um, I was down here in, uh, in the Columbia Gorge, uh, actually looking at some property. And I met a girl, and that's, boy, that's usually the start or the end, one of the two, huh? So, uh, and she and I went out and we got married. Uh, and I asked her to move out to Patterson, Washington with me from Hood River, Oregon. And, uh, and I promised her that if she'd spend one year out there, that would kind of help me finish off my internship so to speak although I wasn't an intern I just but uh, my apprenticeship because that would get us into production with these new vineyards that we put in and 
And I felt like, well, maybe I could go someplace with, with this three years of, of uh, experience. And so she was there for about one month. And uh, by the way, we just uh, celebrated our 34th anniversary. Congratulations. So she was there for about one month and uh, took, the, took the calendar and circled the date that was one year from, from when, we moved, when, when she moved out there and said, we're moving to Hood River in one year. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we did. So uh, that's how I got to the Columbia Gorge. That's how I got into uh, um, doing wine, uh, doing grapes. Um, before I'd started working for St. Michelle, I had uh, taken a job over in uh, Libya, uh, putting a, an irrigated uh, farm in the Sahara Desert. And, uh, and so when it came time to leave, I didn't have a job lined up here in the gorge, uh, but one of the fellows that went over to Libya with me on the previous job uh, called me and said they, they had another job coming up and asked if I'd be interested in going on a crew to to do some, uh, we were going to uh, do some repair work on some, uh, we, we did a lot of pivots in those days, a lot of circle irrigation machines. And so uh, they asked if I'd like to go back over there. And so I went back over there and worked for about four months. And, and in those days, that was pretty good money and kind of helped make a little stack to make this transition to, uh, uh, to Hood River and, and the Gorge area. And uh, got back, uh, was drawn on employment, and uh, looking around, there was, uh, that was uh, 1981 in the fall. Uh, there had just been a big layoff at the Diamond Fruit Company in Hood River, Oregon, and uh, there really wasn't a whole lot going on as far as work. And so I, I decided to try to start a vineyard management company. And uh, so I, it was, it was kind of funny actually. Uh, we were living in Odell and uh, I had a 1962 GMC pickup and I went over and talked to Rick Insminger up at Slilo Vineyards. And I also talked to Chuck Henderson at, at his vineyard. And, uh, uh, Asked, I asked if I could make cuttings off of their prunings. And, uh, and so I would go over and load up all the prunings that were in the middle of the rows. And 16 pickup loads later, with piles of wood uh, piled all over the front yard of, of our house, um, I sat on a porch and made about 15,000 cuttings. And put them in, uh, put them in bark dust and uh, went to see a friend of mine, a friend of Linda's actually. Uh, these are people we just went to Italy with last year. Uh, and asked if we could use their little barnyard. They had two acres and a barn that was about to fall down. It's still standing. I don't know how it hasn't fallen down over the years. But, but that's where I nurseried, uh, 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 made my first uh, grape plants. And somebody from the uh, from the Hood River uh, newspaper, uh, they had a, the front of the second section was called Kaleidoscope, and they'd have an article on Kaleidoscope about something happening in the community. And that article was on uh, Elk Cove Vineyards and Hood River Vineyards. Cliff Blanchett was just about to open Hood River Vineyards, which was the first winery east of the Cascade Mountains in Oregon. And uh, the people that, uh, that Joe and Patch, oh, I can't think of their last name. Anyway, uh, the people that owned Elk Cove Vineyards, uh, uh, the woman was from the Hood River Valley. Uh, she was a, a, a MERS. Her, her family had a pear orchard up there. And so they had a big article about these uh, uh, two couples from Hood River that had their own wineries and were open 
and were some of the very first wineries in, in Oregon. And down in a very corner, down on the bottom, they took a picture of me standing in front of my 15,000 sticks that had no green on them whatsoever, sticking out of the ground. And they had a little blurb and they said, and, and this guy's name is Lonnie Wright, and he says that there's enough plants here to plant 15 acres and that uh, he wants to get a vineyard started in the area. And I actually got a phone call from Harold Hakey uh, asking me if I'd be interested in coming and planting vineyard in the Dalles and leasing his, his uh, vineyard. And so, and he'd seen that article. That's kind of, that's what launched me. Uh, so, and that, uh, that took place in the spring of uh, 82. No, excuse me, the spring of, uh, 83 that was the spring of 83 and uh, and so Harold got a hold of me and I started planting a hillside vineyard here in the Dalles over on Three Mile uh, in the spring of 82 I heard that there was a guy that uh, had that he was going to try and prune up this old this old vineyard that had been around for a long long time and so uh, he had hired, uh, I think he contracted six women to uh, do the work. And my wife knew a couple of the women. And so she knew what time he was going to start and where. And so I showed, I showed up at 7 o'clock on Monday morning. And, uh, and the guy was standing out there with the UC Davis General Viticulture book open to the page on pruning. And he was a cherry farmer, and he was going to try and bring this old vineyard back. And he was trying to read this and tell them what to do. And I said, well, I might be able to help you with this and, and offer my services. And, and I got hired. And, uh, and that's how I got started with the Old Vines Inn Vineyard. Uh, three of the women quit the first day, and the other three stuck it out to the end, and, and, and I worked with them. And we, we, uh, we hoed out every plant. Uh, every plant was just, uh, basically they were just bushes, uh, old wood that, not, hardly anything that was alive on the wood. Maybe two or three shoots about this long, about two to three inches long that were alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we hoed out every plant and then we, uh, uh, then I, started cutting everything off except maybe an arm to stick up and and then cut that that live shoot down to about two buds and see if we could get it to grow and then apparently he liked the way I worked and uh, hired me for cherry harvest and I drove uh, I drove a tractor a crawler tractor during cherry harvest and after cherry harvest he asked me to keep working on the vineyard and the, and the, the, the ladies had done their contract and so they were off on other things so Basically, uh, then I drove two by two stakes in at each plant and started training them up the stakes. Uh, the, uh, and I started researching putting a drip uh, irrigation system on that vineyard. And, and we got it done. We got the irrigation system put in in 1982. And the plants actually took off and grew. It was amazing. Uh, we, uh, and then in 83, we put a trellis in. And a friend of the cherry farmers uh, that lived on Mill Creek uh, talked to me in the winter of 82 about uh, he'd like to have a, put a vineyard in also. And would I be interested in doing a vineyard at, at his place? And I told him that, yeah, I'd be interested, but I really like, needed a place to live. Mm -hmm. And he had a house up on his farm. He actually... Uh, his name is Terry McDuffie, and uh, he actually uh, lived in uh, uh, Los Angeles. He was a small animal veterinarian, uh, and he's been very successful with it. And, uh, and this was his kind of a summer place where he came up to the farm. He's an ex-Missouri farm boy, and he likes to come up to the farm and, and uh, farm hay and cattle. And, 
And so we planted, uh, I planted the McDuffie Vineyard in 83 out of those plants that I had at the, at my friend's barn. So we planted Chardonnay there. And then in 83, uh, no, actually it was in, in uh, yeah, it was in 83 we planted, uh, uh, with Harold Hakey, I planted uh, uh, Riesling at his place. And then continued working on the, uh, the, the Zinfandel Vineyard here. Uh, so those were basically my first three vineyards that I did in the gorge. Uh, and I'm still working all of them today. So, uh, in 1985, my, uh, the, the, the cherry farmer who had hired me and was uh, having me work on these things, he had a financial misstep. He had to give the farm back to the original owner who was the, who was the Mormon fellow from Salt Lake City. He had no interest in wine. Uh, basically, it was just an investment for him. And, uh, and his name is Ken Melby, and he called me in 87 and asked if I'd be interested in moving on a farm and taking care of the place. And so Linda and I and our, our two kids uh, then moved on the Pines in 87, and we've been here, here ever since. I got a lease, I got a 20 year lease from him. Uh, we finally got him to sign it in 1991. I had to rework it a few times. Uh, which gave me an opportunity to uh, increase the vineyard uh, up on the hill. Uh, it was seven acres uh, of old vine, and then, and then I uh, put in another five of starts that came off the old vine in 91, and then uh, put some Merlot in and later some Syrah. Uh, In 2002, yeah, 2002, I was able to uh, to buy the place, and uh, that was about I think that was about uh, 18 years into the lease, and uh, and people were starting to figure out where the old Vine Zinfandel Vineyard was. Uh, and, uh, and I was concerned that somebody was going to try and buy it out from under me. And so I was able to buy the place. I made an offer to him on the, on the 20 acres of vineyard and the uh, 20 acres of uh, property down by the creek uh, with the houses and the, and the barns and the buildings on it. And uh, he said, he said, well, I can't just sell you the best part of the place. You've got to buy the whole thing, all 640 acres. So I bought 640 acres so that I could have that uh, 20. <laughs> and, and I've been pedaling pretty fast ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite a jump. Mm -hmm. So... He'd been good to me. He let us live here at a very reduced rent and it enabled me to help grow my business. And then, uh, and then he got the rent back when he sold us the place. <laughs> um, so I can't tell you about a, a, a few things uh, that have happened. While she was talking, I had an opportunity to put a few thoughts together. Um, so at any rate, that was that was the start. That was the start of uh, of my vineyard management company, and uh, and in the meantime, then uh, we've now planted. Uh, I now farm about 200 acres, and I planted a number of vineyards, or either sided them or sided them, and planted the first stages of them that are actually pretty well known now. Uh, Bob Morris's. Uh, um, uh, vineyard over his place. Uh, Phelps Creek. Uh, yeah, Phelps Creek. Uh, yeah, I planted the, uh, well, me and my crew planted the block that's directly below his house there, the Pinot Noir mm -hmm. block, and uh, helped Bob site that. And, and then Bob took over, we, I think we planted the Chardonnay as well, and then uh, Bob took over after that uh, himself and uh, 
he's done a great job with that with that space, and he's done a really nice job with his winery, and and he's pushed that out from uh, I think we he started with about seven acres, and now I believe he has about 30 acres over there. I always told him that he was going to have to issue a parachute to his tractor driver though, because it's pretty steep over there. But yeah. but that's one of the nice things about it. Uh, the steepness helps catch it's a dead south slope, and it helps catch more sun and, and ripens that fruit. Mm -hmm. um, Why East Vineyards is another vineyard that uh, is pretty renowned that, that uh, I planted. Planted uh, 12 acres of that and then they went ahead. Uh, the people that I was working with, uh, they had an opportunity to sell it and, uh, and they gave me the first chance to buy it but I had bought this place and I didn't want to uh, so I, I couldn't afford both of them. And uh, so then Dick Reed uh, eventually bought that vineyard. He, he planted, uh, he added to it. And, uh, and now they have a winery, Y.E.'s Vineyards. And, uh, and, and they're doing a nice job over there. Um, so I've got, a, there's a couple other vineyards that I'm working with in uh, the Hood River area. And then there's a number of them here in the Dalles. We have about 80 acres on Mill Creek now. That, w that we farm, and about 80 acres over on uh, Three Mile that we farm as well. And then there's uh, 12 acres over in Dowsport, uh, Scorched Earth Vineyard, that I work with Don McDermott on, uh, on the Washington side. And then there's, oh, there's about uh, 20 acres in, in the Hood River area. And then in 2003, uh, we, uh, we started a winery. And uh, we call it the Pines 1852, uh, not the Pines 151. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we started a winery in uh, 2003. We were doing about, oh, I think 600 cases for a couple of, of years. And then my daughter uh, graduated from Linfield, I believe in 2005. She's been with me nine years now, so that would be 2005. So we got to have some more wine, Dad. We're, we're going to sell out here, and and we started a uh, tasting room in the in the Hood River area called the Pines Tasting Room, and uh, had a lot of notoriety because we kind of started uh, uh, started back up uh, live music scene in Hood River and live local music. It was a really big space. Uh, we started out as a 750 square foot space in front of the the art. Uh, gallery and we were subleasing from the art gallery then the art gallery decided uh, at that time that was West Wind Gallery mm -hmm. and they decided at that time that uh, they needed to move back to the Dalles and so we had a decision to make and so we decided to go ahead and take on the other the, the rest of the 4500 square foot space and so then so then we then we are an art gallery and a music uh, and dance place and a wine tasting room. And we were there for, I think we were there about seven years. And last August, uh, we decided that uh, we'd like to move to a smaller space and get rid of some of the overhead. And so we moved down to uh, where we are now on Cascade Avenue. And uh, we we're about uh, 1,300 square feet now, and that's about right. Uh, and my daughter has been working as a general manager. Uh, her name's Sierra, Grotz, uh, Sierra Wright Grotzinger. She just got married last year here on the farm. Um, she's been doing a great job, and I've been lucky to have her running most of the things that are happening with the winery. Uh, I do help her out some, uh, but she's the, she's the driving force on the winery. And that allows me to concentrate on the vineyards. My day job is a grape farmer. And uh, and so uh, and then I do some of the blends with the with the wines. Um, we do uh, we contract uh, wine making. Uh, Peter Ross back from Chenin makes uh, a lot of our wines, uh, and uh, also we've had uh, Lower Ridge Winery uh, making our whites and some of our wines that we uh, a lot of our wines that we put into our blends. So. Um, I think that brings us up to up, up to date. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving some things out, uh, but uh, I think I could 
Uh, I'd like to take you, uh, and maybe we, I can show you the, uh, I can show you the, the old Sandoz winery uh, up Mill Creek. I show you, uh, we can take the 50 cent tour today and I show you the uh, McDuffie uh, vineyards. Uh, the Chardonnay was planted in 1983 and the Cabernet in 85. And we'll go up uh, on the Pines Vineyard and uh, I can show you the old vines in and we can walk out there and, and you can see some of that if you like. We would definitely love to see that. Can I ask you just a couple more sure. questions? Sure, sure. Um, that was a great history on the Pines and you definitely hit all of my bullet points. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions on sort of the, the general area, um, specifically because this is such a unique area. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on why this area is so special, especially when it comes to growing grapes. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit more about the AVA because it's a bi-state AVA and, and the strengths and challenges of that. Right. Um, the, there's a, we have a group called the Columbia Gorge Wine Growers Association and, and we're the uh, marketing and promotion uh, group that does marketing and promotions for this area. The Columbia Gorge AVA actually stops on the Washington side of the river, it stops on the, at the Klickitat River that's the eastern boundary and on the Oregon side of the river it's actually Crates Point uh, a line that goes north and south there and that line happens to go right through my farm the old vine Zinfandel is on the is in the Columbia Valley AVA and the Zinfandel that I started in 1991 off of the old vine is in the Columbia Gorge AVA uh, and I'll show you how that plays up there as well um, so we have decided to promote the area as a whole. So the actual, uh, we're on the west edge of the Columbia Valley AVA and we, in our promotional area is, uh, goes out to Mary Hill, which is about 20 miles east of where we're sitting right now. And we're probably, we're right on the we're basically right on the border between the west, uh, right where the west edge meets the, of the Columbia Gorge, or the east edge of the Columbia Gorge meets the west edge of the Columbia Valley. And then 20 miles west of us is the Hood River Valley. So now that I got that all out without any show and tell, uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody's really wondering where the heck we are. But uh, what I think makes this area really unique, and I've probably planted more vineyards here than anybody has and been doing it for a longer time and spread over a wider space. There's a lot of, actually I shouldn't say that, uh, uh, there are a couple guys that have, Rick Insmere has been farming vineyards even longer than me, but not over as wide a space. He's basically on Underwood Mountain, which is a great area for growing uh, cool weather grapes. And so what, what happens is that, that the the Columbia Gorge is the transition from the Willamette Valley to the Columbia Valley. And it happens in about 40 miles. Um, so you're moving from cool weather grapes, Burgundian and Alsace varieties, uh, on the west end of the Columbia Gorge AVA, which is uh, Hood River Valley. And then on the, on the Washington side would be White Salmon Valley and uh, Underwood Mountain. And then, uh, as you move east, the heat rises and the temperatures go up and the varietals that you can grow become uh, bigger reds, more Bordeaux varietals, uh, uh, Rhone varietals, and even Italian varietals. And uh, so as you move east, when you get to uh, uh, Mill Creek Valley here in, in the Dalles, uh, we're growing, uh, uh, I have Merlot, Syrah, I have a Cabernet vineyard. Uh, you got to have a lot of heat to uh, to uh, grow Cabernet because it picks about a month later than Pinot Noir does, and so in order to get it ripe by the end of October, you have to have a pretty fair amount of heat. Uh, in the Willamette Valley, they're picking uh, their uh, Pinot Noir generally sometime in the first half of October. And, uh, and Cabernet just won't get ripe there because it's, not, it's just not warm enough. Uh, so we even have Zinfandel here. 
So if you were going to take a trip in Europe to see the vineyards of Europe, and you started where the cool weather uh, viticulture was, uh, the Alsace uh, region between France and Germany up north, uh, uh, Burgundy, uh, by the time you drove to Bordeaux and over to the Rhone and then down into Italy where they grow Zinfandel grapes, you probably travel about a thousand miles. And in this area, we truly can grow all of those varietals and do it well within about 40 miles. Um, as I said, I have Zinfandel growing here. Uh, I know Cascade Cliffs has Barbera and uh, uh, oh, they've got a Nebbiola and Nebbiola. Uh, those, it, it, and part of the reason for that is they're right on the banks of the Columbia River. Mm. Now the Columbia River is worth about eight degrees in the winter when we have freezes. It's, and, and also when the plants wake up in the spring. And I have done some research on this because I was considering putting some Barbera in over here up the Mill Creek Canyon, but we're about five miles from the Columbia River. And with them being right on the Columbia, their, their grapes actually come out two weeks earlier than mine do. And their season lasts about two weeks longer. So they pick uh, Barbera in uh, about the first week of November, toward the end of the first week of November. And, and I've got to have my Zinfandel off before then because I'm afraid we're going to get rain at the end of October. And uh, we're a little farther west than they are. Okay. They get nine inches of rain a year. We get 17 inches of rain a year. They're no more than about 10 miles from us as a crow flies. As a matter of fact, if you go from Hood River to the Dalles, you, you lose an inch of rain per mile, and it just holds true all the way. Uh, we're at 17 inches here on Mill Creek Valley. You go over the ridge in a three mile, the next valley over, and there are 13 inches of rain. And you go over the next ridge, and you get to the east side of the Dalles, and there are nine inches, and that would be right across the, the uh, river from Cascade Cliffs. So there's less rain, and there's more heat. And, and it happens in a very, uh, small area. We're talking actually the, the, the transitions in 20 miles and then as you go further east on out to Mary Hill that's another 20 miles from the Dalles and uh, and they have even less rain. They're down to about nine inches at that point of rain per year and they're also quite warm out there. Uh, and uh, that's what I think is uh, really unique is all the varietals that can be grown here mm -hmm. uh, and you can do a good job with them. And uh, so uh, our group uh, adopted the, the phrase, it's a world of wine in 40 miles. And uh, I think that holds very true. Would you say that that's how, exactly how you guys market it, as far as that being the strategy, is, is sharing that uniqueness? Um, we're trying to. Sometimes it's hard to tell that story because it's mm -hmm. hard. Uh, wine writers like to take a grape varietal and put it in this area and put everybody in that area on that varietal mm -hmm. and it, it's 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 uh, cleaner for them when they're when they're writing their articles that's what I think yeah. so it's a little hard I mean somebody really kind of has to start really paying attention to know how many varietals you can grow in, in, a, in an area like this mm -hmm. and uh, um, but I think uh, I've seen uh, so many uh, medals and, and uh, awards uh, given for such a small area. Uh, it's just, it's just going to take time. It takes time to tell a story. I mean, uh, we didn't have wineries here to speak of. Uh, when I said Hood River Vineyards uh, was the first winery, uh, that was about 30 years ago. and. Uh, I think we had uh, four or five wineries here until about 10 years ago. And now we've had uh, an explosion of wineries and we're, we're up to about 30 or 35 wineries in, in our marketing region. Mm -hmm. and, as, uh, and, and some of the wineries are doing very specific varietals and, and some of them do it across the board uh, varietals. And, uh, and they're all going to figure out which, ones, which varietals they want to make. But uh, it just takes time to tell a story. 
you know, the the Willamette Valley and the Columbia Valley, they've they've had about a 20 year head start on us. So now now we get to tell our story. Yeah. Do you have any last thoughts or is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't yet that you want to talk about? Oh, I'm sure, no problem with you, but I'm sure I've, there'll be something that I uh, forgot to say, but uh, you know, maybe, it'll, maybe I'll get the, maybe it'll fall through the cracks, I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that uh, it's been exciting to watch this region grow, and I think it's gonna be uh, a really good uh, wine grape region going forward. Um, there's a lot of people that are very passionate about uh, what they're doing, and uh, and it's a uh, it's just been a great region, and it's going to continue getting better. So, so we're still coming. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.